hello everyone uh, good evening or whatever uh, time you are uh, coming live and uh, to, to this activity we're gonna start uh, the fifth activity of our uh, international webinar series uh, frontiers in with science and it's a pleasure for us to have dr ryan Prost Rosser here we I'm uh, going to introduce him in a bit. Uh, before we do that, I would like to thank you, our, the Brazilian Weed Science Society, that is providing the platform that uh, make, make uh, this activity happen, actually. Very important help. So I think Dr. Aldo Meroto is in the audience. Thank you, uh, who, who, Professor Aldo Meroto from the University of uh, Rio Grande do Sul is the president of the Brazilian Weed Society. Here. So, uh, in this activity, we're gonna we have Dr. Ryan Prosser. Uh, uh, he is associate professor in the School of Environment Science at the University of Go. Uh, we are very glad to to get to know him, uh, mainly through Keith Solomon, who came uh, to to Brazil and, and was here uh, in the last activity that we done presential, one of the international. Uh, meetings that we have. His research group uh, um, conducts uh, research in the field of environment toxicology. They are uh, investigating the effect and the fate of vi various types of contaminants, pesticides, petroleum products, metals, microplastics on aquatic and terrestrial ecosystem. And he'll be talking uh, about assessing the ecotoxicological risk of herbicides this evening. So very nice to have you here, a pleasure to have you here. Uh, you know, everybody is uh, waiting for to, to listen to you. Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Edge, for the introduction. And, uh, and thank you to the uh, organizers of the webinar series for the opportunity. Uh, it's, it's, it's always great to, uh, to talk about some of the stuff, the work that we do, and then obviously to hear from uh, uh, from other people and, and and what interests them and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I I my group, like I'm an environmental toxicologist, and my research group, um, we work on a, a variety uh, of research projects related to the effect and fate of contaminants um, on on the environment. Um, but because, like, at the University of Guelph. Uh, because we have the, the Ontario Agriculture College, uh, agriculture plays a really important role. Um, oops. Um, and so, you know, um, my group uh, and our school of environmental sciences, we do a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of research on, in terms of the fate and the effect of, of pesticides, um, because it's, you know, an important Pest management is an important part of, of modern agriculture. And so, um, and as Edge mentioned, uh, Keith Solomon, Dr. Keith Solomon, uh, he was actually my supervisor for my PhD and now uh, uh, a colleague. But, um, you know, Keith, I think is really well known and, and was a pioneer in the field of ecotoxicological uh, risk characterization. Um, and these principles, oops, these principles um, that uh, I'm going to go through can really be related to any contaminant, um, not not just herbicides. Um, um, so, yeah. So hopefully you find it useful, find it interesting. So basically, I'm just going to outline some important concepts as it relates to uh, ecological risk assessment uh, of chemicals. Um, and then I'm, and then I'm also, then I'm hoping to, you know, show you an example of a project that Keith and I worked on and, and it had, and, uh, and how we sort of employed um, ecolog ecological risk assessment to look at the risk of a herbicide uh, to aquatic ecosystems. Um, all right, good. So I, I think we'll, yeah, I'm just sorry. I'm trying to watch the chat and uh, <laughs> at the same time. But I think I think what we'll do, I guess, is do any questions that people may have yes. at the end. At the end of the uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm just going to move forward here. So just again, I don't know where everybody's coming from in terms of their background uh, in toxicology. I know everybody here is probably obviously interested in weed science, um, but I just wanted to give people a little quick background. 
about toxicology and some of the important terms. Um, and so you can't begin to talk about toxicology without men mentioning Paracelsus. Uh, Paracelsus is sort of uh, the originator, I guess, of the, of the study or the field of toxicology. And he was a Swiss physician uh, back in the 15th century. Um, and, you know, the, the, the phrase that he, Paracelsus, is known for coining is the dose makes the poison. Um, now, if you translate like the old German, it, it comes out, you'll see in uh, bold here, solely the dose determines that a thing is not a poison. Um, you can, you know, it's basically a much more complicated way of saying the dose makes the poison. Um, so we have a lot of things. The idea there, and he was the first one to sort of put this, uh, um, you know, you know, into words and, and, and publish this, but the idea that there's a lot of things that can uh, be poisonous, uh, but it's the exposure, it's the dose, uh, the level of exposure that that makes it the poison, right? There's a lot of different things. And so that's sort of a really important tenant, central tenant to toxicology. Now, how is toxicity expressed? And again, I, I, a lot of you probably already have heard about this, but there's nothing worse than people using acronyms, <laughs> that, assuming everybody knows what they mean. Um, so I just wanted to go through some sort of important acronyms, expressions that we use in toxicology, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Um, so, you know, how is toxicity expressed? Um, you know, we all know that, that in, in nature, there's, there's tons of variability and there's, there's just sort of biological variability when it comes to anything. And, and one of those, you know, how organisms respond to stress or a contaminant, there's going to be a uh, biological variability, right? They're not all going to be as sensitive as others and as, you know, and that's true for a lot of different things. So one of the ways that we express toxicity is with an LD50 or an LC50, right? Uh, so we wanna know what dose or what concentration is gonna cause 50% mortality uh, in, in a population um, for a particular organism. And um, that, you know, the criteria for an LC50 or an LD50 is, is mortality, is death. Um, and that can be expressed, doses can be expressed as, you know, milligrams of a contaminant per kilogram of body weight. Uh, a concentration, an uh, LC50 would be expressed um, in terms of like milligrams per liter per water, right? How much, what concentration in the water would it take to kill 50% of a particular fish species or zooplankton? So these are really important uh, effect measures, we call them like uh, um, measures of effect or measures of toxicity that we use. They're really important for drawing comparisons between contaminants, right? Uh, what, what chemicals are more toxic than others or what species are more sensitive than others? And you're gonna see where that becomes important when we talk about risk assessment or ecological risk assessment. So um, LD50, LC50 is the concentration or the dose that, that would kill 50%. Um, now, there are also like, as you've probably thinking that, you know, lethality or, or mortality is not the only effect endpoint uh, there's a lot of other very important effect endpoints uh, like growth or reproduction. And in particular, when it comes to plants, right, uh, mortality is not really, not really that relevant. You can't sort of say, uh, you know, when the plant is alive or dead or that sort of thing. But you can, if, you can measure uh, things like, germ, you know, seed germination, uh, growth above ground, below ground um, uh, biomass and that sort of thing. And you can express toxicity in the terms of an ED50 or an EC50, right? So uh, it would be a dose that would cause a 50% effect. So whether that's a 50% decrease in reproduction or a 50% decrease um, in the production of above ground biomass or something like that. And then the same concept for EC50, it's a concentration that's gonna cause a 50% effect. Um, and so anyway, so those are just important acronyms that I, I might be that get used in toxicology and ecotoxicology and that I'm going to um, probably use. So I just want to make sure that everybody is on the same uh, same uh, page when it comes down to it. Um, OK, so 
um, expressing toxicity is sort of one element of ecological or ecotoxicological risk assessment, right? You know, describing how toxic a particular substance is. That's, that's sort of one part of it. Often, I think we get really focused on that part, right? Is, is uh, this expression of toxicity, like, well, that, that chemical is very toxic. This chemical is not so toxic and that sort of thing. But really when we want to assess risk, we have to think about two other elements. One is we have to think about exposure. And this is where, you know, Paracelsus, his, his turn, you know, his uh, statement of the dose makes the poison is that the level of exposure uh, plays a very important role, all right? If you have zero exposure, then there's zero risk, right? Even if you have something that's incredibly toxic, very high toxicity, relative high toxicity, but if there's no exposure, then there's no risk. Um, and so, yeah, we, we've got to think about the toxicity of a particular contaminant or a herbicide in this case, but it's important to think about the level of exposure or how organisms, what is the pathway of exposure? What's the magnitude of exposure? And then another, the, the, the third really important component of, of risk is the probability of sensitivity or the probability of exposure, all right? So um, otherwise, if you're only considering toxicity and exposure, like worst case scenario exposure, that's really a hazard assessment, right? Where you're just looking at toxicity and exposure, you can determine whether there's a hazard or not. But if you really wanna get at, is there a risk or, or you wanna quantify risk, you have to consider the probability of exposure um, and the probability of sensitivity uh, within the population. And I'm gonna go through uh, how, how we would go about doing that in, in an ecotoxicological risk assessment is how would we, uh, you know, what kind of information are we gonna need in order to, to make an estimate or uh, you know, look at whether the level of risk is acceptable for the use of a particular contaminant or a particular herbicide. This is another diagram to sort of express that Venn diagram, that previous slide. This is another way of, of expressing it. Um, and what you're looking at here is two distributions. You have uh, a distribution of toxicity, right? So this could be, this could be just a single species, you know, there's going to be you have a population um, and uh, you know, uh, the effect on that population is going to change with the concentration, right? So you have a probability curve here, probability of a certain level of toxicity. Um, and then also exposure, right? There's a, there's a, a range or a, a distribution of potential exposures that could occur. And now where risk, comes in is where those two distributions overlap, right? Um, when you have exposure, you know, a level of exposure that is higher uh, than a particular level of toxicity, then, you know, that's this overlapping region here. And then you have, you have, a, you have potential risk. Um, usually the, the magnitude of the risk is, is determined by how much overlap you have between that distribution of toxicity and that distribution of exposure. Now, this is not a great way. This is a really simple way, but not the best, most useful way to express, um, you, know, uh, the, you know, the overlap between these two distributions. But most people are usually uh, most familiar with this kind of Gaussian or nor normal distribution. We actually prefer to use a cumulative frequency distribution when we're doing uh, an ecological risk assessment because it's just easier to use, easier to interpret, easier to come to some sort of risk conclusion. So this is how we usually express uh, toxicity or exposure. Um, we like to use, like I said, a cumulative frequency distribution. Um, and, uh, and so I'm just gonna go through what each of these sort of are showing us. Over here, this is, this is an exposure distribution. And, and this, is, this, would, is an, uh, this would be 
Can everybody hear me? Sorry, I think I got muted there for a second. Um, <clears throat> so this is an exposure distribution um, and how you might uh, go about creating an exposure distribution is uh, you're concerned about a particular contaminant being in particular media, whether it's in the water, it's in the soil, uh, or even in the air, for example, and you're gonna take a bunch of measurements. Uh, maybe these are, uh, they're taken across a, a region um, or they're taken at different times, but you're, you're gonna go out there and you're gonna measure um, uh, to get an idea of what the range of concentrations that might be present or the range of potential exposures that may occur. This, this distribution can also be, you could also create this through modeling, right? Uh, if you wanted to sort of model or predict potential exposures, you could create an exposure distribution through modeling. But the best way is, is through actual getting out into the field and taking measurements. <clears throat> and once you've taken those measurements, you can create a cumulative frequency distribution. And so um, what you have here on the x-axis is the concentration, right? So you, you know, imagine you have a bunch of little points here because from all the samples that you've taken uh, and you've measured the concentration. Um, and then what you're gonna do is you're going to give them a percent rank um, and it allows you to create this cumulative frequency distribution. Now, why, why this is useful, <clears throat> why this is, uh, how this can be used is that you can, by giving it a percent rank, by putting it in a cumulative frequency distribution, you can say, well, um, what concentration, you know, is going to be present 10% uh, of the time? Right, so that's where you can go on the, the y axis and say, well, you know, if this is the, 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 the fifth centile, you can follow it across and you can say, well, the concentration in that water body is going to be, uh, you know, above or below a particular concentration 10% of the time, or depending on, you know, you could say it's going to be above or below that 90% of the time. So that's what a cumulative frequency distribution allows you to do. Um, but the important thing is, and I've mentioned, I've, I've noted this, is that one of the, the limitations and one of the things you, you always need to take into consideration with an exposure distribution is the limits of detection, right? Um, uh, ideally, <clears throat> um, this shouldn't be too much of an issue, right? Um, but limits of detection, I mean, we, we had this issue arise here in Canada and Ontario when it came to neonicotinoid insecticides. Um, we were monitoring neonicotinoid insecticides in water bodies, in rivers and streams, um, and we were detecting it frequently. Um, but uh, when we went to look at the toxicity, we found that there were, you know, uh, effect measures, LC50s for particular, particular, especially aquatic invertebrates that were well below the detection limit. Uh, so the, the, the concentration where we would start to see an effect was, was really much lower than our detection limit. So then we realized, you know, we're not gonna be able to do an effective risk characterization because we can't really characterize the level relevant exposure uh, to these organisms because our detection limit's too low. So the provincial government had to spend a lot of uh, some time lowering those detection limits so that we could get out there in the field and measure at low levels um, because that at those even low levels, you, you, may, you may observe toxicity with a particular group of organisms. So, so this is an exposure distribution. Um, probability, and then this is a toxicity distribution. So the toxicity distribution, same thing, x-axis on the concentration, but the, the toxicity distribution is actually going to be made up of individual species, right? Because you're going to have some species uh, that have very low LC50s, which means they're very sensitive. Your sensitive organisms are going to be down here in the lower part of your, your distribution, and then you're less sensitive less sensitive species are going to be up here. Uh, they're going to have higher LC50s because, and, and this is particularly relevant for herbicides. If you're a primary producer, right? If you're a plant uh, and, and we're looking at the risk of a, her, of a herbicide, you're likely going to be in the lower part of this distribution, right? You're going to have a lower LC50 it's, or, or EC50. Now, if you're a fish uh, or a small mammal, depending on the herbicide you're dealing with, 
you know, just due to the mode of action of the herbicide, you're probably going to be up here, right? You're going to be less sensitive to exposure. Um, but when we're doing an ecological risk assessment, we really want to have, we want to look at all the different species or groups of species that may be present in the ecosystem, and we want to have them represented in our toxicity distribution. And then ultimately, you know, once we accumulate all this data, data on toxicity, data, potential, uh, data on potential exposure, we want to look at how these overlap. And one of the ways to, to simplify that is first to make those cumulative frequency distributions, to make them linear. <laughs> That's always easier. So um, we may, you know, put it on a log scale or that sort of thing to make them linear. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put them on the same set of axes because we want to see I mean, ultimately when it comes down to determining risk, we want to see where these two distributions overlap, right? So here in red, we have our species sensitivity distribution or our toxicity distribution. Here in, in green, we have our exposure distribution. So these are, this is sort of the range of concentrations or doses that, that, that might be occurring in the environment or may you know, a group of organisms may be exposed to. And we want to look at uh, where, how much these overlap, right? How much does uh, the exposure distribution overlap uh, with the toxicity distribution? What species uh, are, are going to be at most at risk, right? Um, the species of down here are probably, you know, where we have overlap with the exposure distribution. That's, they're going to be at the greatest risk. These species up here that are up in the, or that represent the upper part of our distribution, are pr there's probably going to be much less risk to them because there's very little overlap with the exposure distribution. Um, one of the metrics that's often used uh, when you're, you're, you're doing a probabilistic risk assessment like this is, you know, one of your assessment goals when you start the assessment is that 95% of species would be protected 95% of the time, okay? So 95% of the species would be protected 95% of the time. That's has been proposed, for example, by the US EPA, that's been used in, in Canada. Protecting 100% of species 100% of the time, uh, you know, is seen as, as, as being incredibly difficult or un unrealistic. Um, and so 95% of the species, 95% of the time is usually what is used as the assessment goal. You know, if you're, if you're trying to set a water quality guideline or a soil quality guideline, that's usually what they're using. And so what that means is, is that, you know, you're looking for a concentration where 95% of the species. So for example, if this is our, uh, our species or our toxicity distribution, we're going to go down here to the fifth centile, right? And we're going to we're going to follow it across until we hit our distribution. So here we at the fifth centile, you know. So five percent of the species are below that, ninety five or above. This concentration here, this would be the concentration that ninety five percent of species would be protected, right? Because ninety five percent of my toxicity distribution has an LC fifty above that 5% of my distribution, so 5% of species have an LC50 below that. So that if you were gonna set a water quality guideline or a air quality or soil quality or sediment quality guideline, that's how you might use your toxicity distribution. If you're trying to do an ecological risk assessment and you actually have exposure data you're going to be looking at, again, this is the fifth centile, right? So this is an important point on my toxicity distribution. How often or how much of my exposure distribution uh, exceeds that? And you can see here in this example that we've got a bit of a problem, right? Because if this is the concentration that would, would protect 95% of species, we can see that it's being exceeded, right? If we follow and look at where the distributions overlap, you can see that, you know, roughly 30% of the time that concentration is being exceeded, right? And so um, this is how you would, you know, use this, these two distributions to either make decisions on setting criteria 
or if you're trying to decide whether there's an acceptable level of risk or an unacceptable level of risk, uh, how, how uh, what level of risk, um, you know, are, are we experiencing in this scenario for this particular contaminant? Um, this is how you would use this. And so this is an actual a true assessment of risk because we're not only looking at, you know, the toxicity of the contaminant, we're not only looking at, you know, potential exposure, but we're looking at the probability of toxicity and the probability of exposure, okay? So now I want to, uh, oops, now I just want to like talk about a particular case study where Keith, Dr. Solomon and I uh, actually, you know, and this is, this is related to a herbicide. We actually had to, uh, you know, the big question was, is does this herbicide that's being used, does it pose a, an unacceptable risk to aquatic ecosystems? And so this, uh, this, is, this question and this study is relevant uh, for Colombia. So uh, Colombia, they, um, the Colombian government was uh, instituting a spray program. So they were using glyphosate uh, and it was, they were using that program to control coca production in rural areas. And so they were doing an aerial spraying to try to, you know, reduce the amount of, uh, of coca and, and trying to control, you know, the production of cocaine. So this is just uh, from the helicopter showing, you know, this is a section of jungle uh, that's been cut down, burnt. And then, you know, you can see all the individual little coca plants that are growing. And this is what it, it looks like uh, uh, from the ground. You can see all the little individual coca plants. So, uh, and, and I guess one of the issues is that these, these, set, these plantations are in quite rural or areas that are hard to, to you know, access. So aerial spraying was seen as maybe a potential solution to control this. But obviously the concern for Colombians uh, and for the Colombian government is, well, you know, what risk does this pose to, to human health, right? Those people living in this region, but then also like the ecological health, you know, and we specifically were looking at uh, aquatic ecosystems, right? Um, anytime you have an aerial spray program, uh, you know, drift can be, you know, if not done properly, drift can be an issue, right? You have the movement of herbicide off site, um, through drift, through spray drift. And so um, I'm going to try to show you a, oh. Yeah, so this was the, this showing, this is the product, you know, this is the leaves is what you want to collect, I guess. And, and that was what they were trying to, uh, you know, the use of glyphosate would cause the foliage uh, to fit relatively quickly uh, start to brown um, and, and basically, uh, you know, kill the plant and not make it useful uh, in, in, in cocaine production. Um, so, oh boy, what's going on here? So the, this, this, is a, <laughs> this image here shows you why someone might be concerned about exposure to, to aquatic ecosystems. So here you have two uh, spray planes, um, and they're going in and you can see that they're, you know, trying to spray the cultivated area, but you can see in this picture that that stream there, that little river is going to be directly oversprayed. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that, that could potentially be a bit of a problem ecologically. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sure most jurisdictions have uh, regulations about, I mean, at least, because we do do aerial spraying, for example, in Canada in our forestry industry, they do use glyphosate uh, in the forestry industry for site preparation, for conifer release. That's going to be a separate issue. But one of the important elements of that is that you, you have to have a spray buffer around any water bodies. Uh, you can't directly overspray um, a, a river or a stream or a lake or that kind of thing. And there needs to be a large buffer around those no a no spray buffer but unfortunately in this situation you know there was instances where you know uh there there may be overspray and so uh they wanted to know well what what risk uh does that pose uh to those systems so one of the things that 
um, initiated this study was uh, they were changing formulation. So they were, you can see here, these are some of the formulations that they had used previously in their, their spray program. Um, I mean, they're all glyphosate based, um, you know, glyphosate, the isopropyl amine salt was the active ingredient, um, but the big change. So these were the previously used um, formulations, but they were moving to a new formulation. So this Cuspide 480 SL, and you can see that the big difference um, was the surfactant. And that's an important element. And we'll come to that later. But you can see that POEA, polyethoxylated taloamine, which is a common surfactant used in glyphosate formulations, um, that was the surfactant in the previously used formulations, but they were moving to a new one. And it was using these alkyl polyglycosides, so these like sugar-based um, sugar-based surfactant. Um, and that, that occurred, that change uh, occurred in 2011. And they wanted to know, you know, uh, there's, there's lots of data out there on sort of these uh, more traditional formulations, but what about this new formulation? Does it pose a greater risk, less of a risk? And, and that's where uh, the, our study came in. So just to give you some background, What's the difference between POEA and this new surfactant? Uh, POEA, as you can see here, um, you know, you have these ethoxylated carbon chains, right? So you have this uh, hydrophilic portion, uh, and then you have, and it's a tertiary amine, right? So you've got a nitrogen with three, uh, two ethoxylated chains, and then uh, a carbon chain. Um, so this is sort of the, the hydrophobic portion, the hydrophilic. Um, and uh, it's actually POEA is sort of a, a mixture of different chain lengths. And that's sort of the go-to surfactant in a lot of glyphosate formulations. Now, the alkyl polyglycosides are, as you can see, these are, these are six carbon sugars that are, that are put together. And that, that gives you the hydrophilic portion. And then they have a carbon chain, which gives you the hydrophobic part, right? Because that's kind of, you got to have the polar and non-polar portion to have an effective surfactant. So that's, that, that was the big change between those formulations. Um, so the big, the research questions was, is, you know, how toxic is this new formulation to aquatic species? And does the aerial application of it uh, represent hazard or risk to aquatic species? So what we, what we, how we would go about you know, fig, in trying to answer this question is first d is, is generating toxicity data, right? Because we, we ultimately, we want to create a toxicity distribution. So we want to figure out, you know, how toxic is this formulation to different species? And, and as you all may know, there's, and it, this, this varies re regionally, there's, there's a variety of, of different standard species that are used. Um, and standard protocols for assessing toxicity. And those standard protocols are useful so that, you know, it, it makes it easier to draw comparisons between studies or between species, right? If we're all using similar standardized test methods. Um, so we looked at a number of primary producers because we, we wanted to, you know, we didn't want to just sort of exclusively do fish, right? Everybody, you know, usually a lot of times focuses on fish when it comes to aquatic. But we know that in an aquatic ecosystem, fish are an important component, but there's a, a number of groups of other organisms uh, that are important. And so we, we wanted to look at primary producers, right? They're a really important part of a healthy aquatic ecosystem. Also uh, invertebrates, uh, not like pelagic as well as benthic invertebrates and fish. Because um, we recognize, you know, you want to have a species sensitivity distribution that ideally represents as many or a variety of the species that would be present in an aquatic ecosystem, right? If you, if you wanna be confident in your risk conclusion, you wanna you know, have as many species and, 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 and have all the different groups of species represented in that distribution. So for primary producers, we looked at you know, green algae and duckweed, which is a, a floating macrophyte. These, these species, Pseudochristianella subcapitata and lemna minor are, are common uh, freshwater primary producers that are that are standard for toxicity testing. We followed um, 
you know, recognized international guidelines. So the ASTM static toxicity test for microalgae and the OECD seven day growth inhibition test for the lem lemna minor. I'm not going to go into a ton of details about that. Um, but, you know, uh, they do look at a number of, of endpoints, effect endpoints. So they'll look at, for the algae, we look at cell density, we look at growth rate. Um, we also looked at um, uh, effective quantum yield. So, sorry, my dog is running around here. Go lay down. Um, effective quantum yield is just a measure of, of their photosynthetic efficiency. Um, so anyway, there's a number of endpoints because some endpoints are more sensitive than, than others. Um, and so th that's what we took a look at with the primary producers. Um, then we also look at pelagic invertebrates. Uh, so zooplankton, uh, Daphnia magna or Cereo Daphnia dubia. Uh, these are both OECD uh, guidelines. Um, and we not only look at mortality, but we also look at reproduction. So their ability to reproduce. Um, and, uh, and again, these, these are important, uh, you know, important species because they represent important forage for other invertebrates and for fish and that sort of thing. Uh, we also looked at benthic invertebrates. Um, and uh, so we looked at four different species. Some of these are emergent, which means that, you know, they spend the, the, the larval portion of their life uh, in water and then actually emerge. And so they actually represent an important link between the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems. They represent important forage for terrestrial invertebrates or uh, for birds and other, other terrestrial organisms. So, um, so this species here, uh, Hexagenia, is an emergent mayfly. Uh, and this species here, the little red worms, looks like a worm, but it's actually a midge, a non-biting midge. So these two, they spend their, you know, life, uh, you know, majority of their life in the water. And then when they mature, they'll emerge. Um, and then we also looked at um, Hylella azteca, which is just like a, a little crustacean, benthic crustacean, and then Lumbriculus variegatus, which is a, uh, a benthic uh, worm. And so again, these, are, these would all be considered benthic invertebrates, but they, 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 they potentially could have different sensitivities to a particular contaminant because they're, they are very different uh, invertebrates, right? These, these two are insects. This one's a crustacean. This one is an oligocate worm, right? So uh, I think sometimes we kind of say, well, you know, aquatic bugs, but, you know, we got to remember that there's a variety taxonomic of, of, of aquatic invertebrates, some pelagic, some benthic, but they have very different physiology. So the contaminant, whichever contaminant we're assessing the risk of could have varying effects depending on their, you know, what taxonomic group they're in. So we try to, uh, to do testing on, on as a diverse a group of organisms as possible. But at the same time, you know, this, this costs money, this takes time. So, you know, you know, there has to be a limit um, to the number of species you're going to include in your distribution. So, um, but every effort should be made to try to make sure that you have a diverse uh, uh, distribution, toxicity distribution. We also look at gastropods. So snails, aquatic freshwater aquatic snails. So we look at mortality of the adults. Here's the adult. But then we also look at uh, reproduction. Right, so uh, a particular exposure may not kill the adults, but it may inhibit their ability to reproduce. Because we have to remember, when we're doing an ecological risk assessment, we want to protect the population, right? Which means that you know, yeah, we don't want to kill individuals or limit the mortality of individuals within the population, but we also want we you know we also need to address you know reproduction because if a population you know can't reproduce. Um, then the population, you know, we may not have killed all the individuals in the population or a large percentage of the individual to the population, but if they can't reproduce, that population is going to be in trouble. Um, and then finally, we looked at fish. Um, we looked at three different fish species. Two uh, would be considered cold water species. So uh, this is uh, rainbow trout and lake trout. And then the fathead minnow, 
um, is sort of a, a more warm water species. And again, these are standard species that are used. Now, you may be thinking, and, and this is a, a very good question, and this comes up often, are these, is this relevant for Columbia, right? Because I mean, yeah, okay, sure. These are standards, standard test species, let's say in Europe or in North America, but is it relevant for a freshwater ecosystem in this particular regions of Columbia? And that's a really good a point to be brought up. And that's a point that we brought up with them is that, you know, uh, when all, all is said and done and we do this risk assessment, and using this toxicity data, one of the sources of uncertainty in our risk assessment is, uh, are the species that we've chosen relevant for, you know, the organisms that are going to be present in a Colombian stream? And I think that's one of the weaknesses, uh, you know, of, of applying maybe a North American or European perspective or data um, to a, to a different region, right, um, for a particular contaminant. I mean, that's something that's all, always needs to be taken into consideration and thought about. Now, in all likelihood, if you have a very diverse species sensitivity distribution, right, we've included warm water species, cold water species, a variety of different invertebrates, a variety of different primary producers, you're likely going to, you know, those, those regionally specific species that aren't present are likely going to be represented. Like, you're going to have a a distribution that's likely going to represent that that distribution in that that other region, but it it, it is a source of uncertainty in a risk assessment, and and it's definitely a source of uncertainty in this risk assessment because uh, we're applying sort of North American uh, standardized protocols to a Colombian question. So after it's all said and done, you've done all these toxicity tests this is what you're gonna create, right? This is our toxicity distribution, all right? This is our species sensitivity distribution. And uh, you can see all the, all the points in, that are colored, those are, e those are individual toxicity tests, all right? And the, the green triangles are uh, primary producers. Uh, the blue circles are invertebrates. The yellow circles are invertebrates. Uh, and the, the, the squares are fish. Um, and so basically for each one of those species, we determined a, uh, a, an effect measure, right? Uh, a concentration that will cause a certain effect. And then we create our distribution. And you can see, and remember this is a glyphosate formulation, as you would expect fish, uh, and invertebrates are going to be much less sensitive to a glyphosate formulation than primary producers. You can see that the primary producers here are much further to the left in our, our, our distribution, which means that they're much more sensitive to this formulation than the species up here. Now, what I've also plotted on here is um, data, so I've taken data that we have on, uh, you know, previously, like, because remember, this data is for a new glyphosate formulation for cuspidae. Um, but what I've done is plotted data uh, from, that we already have on the previously, you know, more traditionally used uh, glyphosate formulations that contain POEA. So that's all the black and white. So there's, there's a lot more data. And one of the interesting takeaways when we compare this new formulation with uh, previous formulations of glyphosate, again, primary producers are, are, are gonna make up the lower tail of distribution. That hasn't changed. And, and the reason for that is, is glyphosate, the herbicide is driving toxicity, right? Because glyphosate is designed to you know, inhibit the production of aromatic amino acids and that system, which you know, is present in weeds, that's why we use glyphosate on weeds, that system is also gonna be present uh, in algae or be present in uh, aquatic plants. So they're, they're gonna be effective, affected as well. Um, um, sorry, I, I need to not look at the... Uh, 
try to look at the questions while I'm talking. It's, it's distracting. I look, I look the chat. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. So what the big takeaway here was that you know if you're a primary producer, it really doesn't matter what glyphosate formulation you have. There's not a huge you know. It's because the presence of glyphosate is going to, you know, be a problem for you. But if you're a fish or an invertebrate, uh, this new formulation is actually much less toxic and than previous formulations. And in all likelihood, this is due to the, um, uh, the surfactant, right? So, because that's the big difference between these two, the amount of glyphosate hasn't changed. Um, but the surfactant has, right? So moving from that POEA to the, uh, al poly al the alkyl glycosides has had uh, a considerable change, right? Almost a, a tenfold to a hundredfold change in the toxicity to fish or to invertebrates. Um, and so uh, that was an important, you know, takeaway from the study. But then again, again, if you're a primary producer, it's, 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 it's not really going to make much of a difference now. So this is a toxicity distribution. And, um, one of the things that we wanted to do is to say, okay, well, here's the distribution of toxicity, but what, what's an environmentally relevant concentration. And so one of the things that's done in risk assessment, in North America, or in uh, Europe is to assume uh, 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 you have a water body that has a particular depth. And um, because if you, and you're assuming direct overspray, because, you know, if, if you're, if you're, uh, you know, if you, you, you probably have some idea of the application rate of your herbicide formulation. Um, so the biggest factor that's going to influence the, um, the concentration in that water body is the depth of that water body, assuming you're doing direct overspray. And um, so the, the shallower the water body, uh, the higher the concentration is going to be. So that's what these lines here represent. If you have a 15 centimeter deep water body, which would be relevant maybe for a, a small forest pool, uh, this is the concentration that's, that's going to be present if you're using the recommended application rate. And then if you have a 30 centimeter deep or a hundred centimeter deep or a 200 centimeter deep water body. These, this is the resulting concentration you're gonna have. So you can see for a, for a deeper water body, uh, you know, the, con the resultant concentration is, is not going to exceed many of these species. But for shallower water bodies, because in Canada we use 15 centimeter pond, uh, because in, this is from a forestry perspective, we're concerned about small vernal ponds because they're important for amphibian reproduction and that kind of thing. So we use a very conservative. This is the result in concentration. You can see that uh, if you have direct overspray, you know, this is in the realm that some of these, well, definitely the primary producers are, are their effect measures may be exceeded and you're, you may see effects. And so what, uh, what we did next was to say, okay, uh, and I mean, you saw this in the graph, but we said, okay, if we, let's assume worst case scenario, we have direct overspray uh, and the application rate is 8.2 liters per hectare or 2.9 kilograms of active ingredient per hectare. And let's say it's a 15 centimeter deep pond, which is very, very conservative. Uh, the US uses a hundred, uh, but in Canada for the forestry, example, we use 15. And what we want to, what we want to do is we, we can calculate what the concentration would be in that pond. And is it going to exceed uh, the effect measures? So these are all the effect measures for our different species. And you can see that, um, well, let me go back here. You can see that um, for the primary producers, particularly for green algae, you're going to have an exceedance, right? It's going to create a problem. Um, and uh, the other big takeaway from our study was also um, one of them that will be exceeded as well is, is or close to is, is the hyalella, one of the invertebrates. But what we found was um, 
the toxicity to the invertebrates again was influenced by the addition of this cosmoflux. So this is another adjuvant that was added to the formulation, um, and you know, along with the alkyl uh, glycosides, polyalkyl glycosides, and that presence of that uh, cosmoflux, which was which was mainly mineral oil, had a huge you know, caused a big change in, in the toxicity of the formulation to, to some of the invertebrates. So you can see with Hylella Azteca and Daphnia Magna, there was a big, quite a, quite a large change in the toxicity based on the presence of this additional adjuvant. Um, so the big takeaway uh, from this initial assessment was, you know, how toxic is this new formulation? Well, it's less toxic than previous formulations if we're talking about invertebrates or uh, uh, fish. But in terms of primary producers, not, not really much of a change. Now, the big question, and I, you know, we, I don't think we could answer this fully, but we could answer it partially. Does the aerial application of this formulation represent a hazard to aquatic species? If again, if you're an invertebrate or a fish, uh, and assuming we're assuming worst case scenario, we're assuming direct overspray. Um, if you're an invertebrate or a fish, the risk is likely de minimis. Uh, but if you're a primary producer, you know, and we're using a conservative scenario of 15 centimeter deep pond or stream, uh, you know, there the primary producers, algal species will will potentially could be impacted. Um, and therefore that freshwater ecosystem could be potentially impacted. Now, one of the things to really take into consideration whenever we do like a risk assessment like this is to, is to really consider the sources of uncertainty. And I already mentioned one is that, uh, are, you know, the question, are the species that we used in the assessment relevant for the Colombian, you know, water bodies in that region. Um, also, another one is that, you know, you may have noticed we, we didn't actually measure glyphosate concentrations, um, you know, on the ground, right? We weren't monitoring to see, you know, what the level of exposure was. We modeled it, right, by, by assuming a worst case scenario or a certain depth. So if you wanted to, you know, take this risk assessment to a, a higher tier, uh, that would be in a way of doing it um, would be um, uh, to actually get on the ground and measure concentrations uh, in the, in the ecosystems. Um, and Cause it might give you a better idea of the potential, you know, a better assessment of the risk. Um, now to also to give you a little bit of background, I mean, this, and this is a whole other seminar is this, this program has been stopped. I mean, I, I'm not sure how effective the program was at actually reducing the cultivation of coca. Um, and, but it was, it was pretty contentious as you can imagine, right? Cause your air, you know, aerial spraying. And then in 2015, when the IARC decision came out on glyphosate, you know, and it's, it's carcinogenicity, uh, the program was stopped. Um, and, and, and again, that's a whole other seminar about the, the carcinogenicity of glyphosate to humans and the IARC decision. But, you know, um, <clears throat> that's another scenario, another situation of, of, of you know, considering exposure um, and uh, when making decisions and, and the difference between a hazard assessment and a risk assessment. Uh, but again, that's a human health different issue. But but yeah, so hopefully it gives you some, you know, some idea of how you might, how we would go about doing an ecological risk assessment of a herbicide. Um, it would really start with um, determining uh, the toxicity of, of the active ingredient of that formulation to a variety of species. Um, and, then, and then looking at what is an environmentally relevant exposure um, and, uh, and determining, you know, how much those, those two distributions overlap. Um, obviously, I teach a whole course on this. So there is, <laughs> there's much more uh, to it uh, in terms of, you know, the duration of your toxicity tests and fate in the environment. That's, but this would hopefully give you an overview of, of how a probabilistic risk assessment uh, might, might be done. So, um, yeah, so... At, at this point, 
uh, it would be great. I'd be happy to take any questions. I hope I didn't go too long, Edge. Wasn't keeping an eye on the clock. <laughs> I have to turn my my okay. audio back on. <laughs> Very well, thank you, Ryan, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we have we have time to take some questions, and I seen that people have done that yet. So uh, probably the best is for you to to go to it uh, on the mm, yeah. platform. Yeah, so it's just, op yeah, I opened it up. So Juan asks, I want to know if Professor Prosser has information about main herbicides and insecticides used in agricultural fields, e.g. soybean and maize, data of toxicity and ecotoxicity on soils and honeybees. Um, so, uh, yes, I certainly would, would, be, would have data on that. Um, I work very closely with Nigel Rain, Dr. Nigel Rain, you may or may not know Dr. Nigel Rain, but he he does a lot of work on the impact of pesticides on pollinators specifically, like like honeybees, bumblebees. Um, so yeah, I mean we have a lot of uh, in Ontario, for example, uh, that is a common rotation in Ontario uh, is soybean, uh, winter wheat, uh, and corn. So yeah, so we, there's a lot of data. Uh, we have a lot of data on in terms of uh, the toxicity. Of, of relevant uh, herbicides and insecticides that would be used. Now in Ontario, for example, a lot of, uh, a lot of the soybean and corn and wheat, I believe, is treated, the seeds treated. And so that's a really, uh, in particular, the use of neonicotinoids, that's, that's been a, 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 quite an issue, particularly when it comes to pollinators and non-target insects. Um, and so that's, there's been a lot of work done by the Canadian government to look at the risk of neonicotinoids um, and their use in seed treatments. Um, and, and again, canola is another big one. But that's more out west, like in Calgary and the prairies, huge canola production, almost all of that canola is treated. Uh, um, seed is treated. So yes, yeah, so there's a lot of data out there. One, if you ever want to, uh, uh, yeah, reach out to me, I, I can get you more specific numbers or information. Any, yeah, just let me know. Um, um, Cassio says, is terrestrial ecotoxicology more important than aquatic ecotoxicology to evaluate field applied herbicides? Why? Yeah. So um, that's a good question. And I think like in toxicology, uh, often aquatic ecosystems received a lot more attention than terrestrial. And I do my, my, I'm one of a few groups that actually does a lot of terrestrial work. Like, so we do work with uh, terrestrial Alligacates and invertebrates. I work closely with Nigel to look at terrestrial insects. Um, I don't do a lot of mammal, uh, like you know, small mammal uh, toxicity. But in in this scenario, um, that was an important point that came up after we did the aquatic uh, assessment. Was okay. Well, what what's the risk uh, to the to the terrestrial? You know, because it is the majority of that active ingredient, the majority of that product is going on terrestrial. And so we, we did have discussions about that. Um, the, one of the things that came out was the relative risk. I mean, if we're talking about, you know, and this is a very specific scenario, but, um, you know, the fact that the, the sections of the jungle were being cut down and burned <laughs> probably represented a much greater risk to the natural flora and fauna than, than the glyphosate being sprayed, you know what I mean? So, but, but, you know, again, we had the concern of direct overspray over streams, but there could also be concern about um, uh, if you're not applying it properly, or you could have drift into natural portions of the jungle where it could be having an impact. And again, I think it's probably having the greatest impact on uh, uh, plant species, right? You know, native plant species. 
and that may have indirect effects on other, uh, 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 you know, other invertebrates or small mammals that rely on those plant species. But, um, but they didn't do uh, any work on that. Like, but that that that's a relevant point. Is if you have drift into the natural portion of the jungle, what impact is that going to have? Um, but unfortunately, they didn't look at that. Yeah. Um, Alvaro says, does the climatic effects play a role winter similar to summer? Uh, that's a, a really good point. Um, and, it, and that's not only relevant. Uh, yes, I think it, it does for sure. Um, temperature plays a role uh, in toxicity. We know that. Um, and that's particularly relevant, not only for, you know, uh, what time of year in a particular region, but also from the perspective of tropical to temperate, right? Because a lot of the species you saw that I was testing, those are temperate species. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in that area of Columbia or other regions, you may be dealing with, with species, you know, that are more, that are tropical and how they respond to a particular contaminant may vary. I mean, we have examples of that. Like, for example, there's some old data out there on organophosphate insecticides. Uh, if you look at temperate as opposed to tropical species, um, temperate species are actually more sensitive uh, because the tropical species have a higher, uh, a higher uh, body temperature on average. So they are able to metabolize their organophosphates faster. Um, but that's, that's not true across the board. I'm just saying that's just an example. But temperature um, does play a role. I mean, not only uh, time of year at a particular location, but then also regionally, that's, that's going to have an influence for sure. And I think that's one of the, the sources of uncertainty or weaknesses in our risk assessment is, you know, we're doing using temperate species to try to do a risk assessment on really a, a tropical or semi-tropical area. Yeah, can I make a comment on that? Please, or, please uh, yeah. Uh, also, the environment would, would uh, or the climate would impact how long that chemical will stay in the environment. So uh, not, not only how it reacts with uh, our organs, but how long it will stay, how long the, the concentration will stay. Uh, so that's a, it's an important yeah, for sure. I mean, water, water temperature is going to have a, a big influence on microbial degradation and for glyphosate, microbial degradation is important. Um, and uh, yeah, so. Uh, okay, uh, Casio, glyphosate degradation is faster in soil than in water. Does the greater persistence of the herbicide in water increase the risk to aquatic organisms? So that's a good point. Um, one of the things about glyphosate specifically and this is something we always have to take into consideration with our contaminant when we think about aquatic toxicity is it is it is it prone to sorb to uh organic material um so like it's it's kocs can some you know the uh organic carbon water partition coefficient can be an important factor here um so greater persistence can be an issue yeah, the, the longer that, it, the more persistent it is, the more potential exposure you have. But with glyphosate, um, one of the things from an aquatic perspective is it, it really doesn't like to stay in the water column. It would much prefer to bind to organic carbon in the sediment or, uh, you know, organic material. So, for example, here in Ontario, the glyphosate is, is used a lot. Ontario, sorry, is the province in Canada that, that I live in. And uh, in my university's located glyphosate's used a lot because a lot of the, uh, the soybean corn, it's roundup ready, right? So it's been genetically modified. So glyphosate's used a lot. And I'm part of, uh, like the water monitoring program in the province with the, with the provincial government. And we hardly ever detect glyphosate in water samples. Like if I go to a stream and take a water grab, even in a very agricultural area, I, we hard like less than 90%, not less than 9% of samples actually are we able to detect glyphosate. Now, that's not to say it's not there, right? Or we know it's definitely being used, uh, but glyphosate likes to absorb. Uh, so when I, you know, if I was to go, if I go and take a sediment sample from that stream, then I'll detect it, you know? Um, so 
So persistence is important, but also fate, you know, not only how long is it going to be there, but where is it going to go when it enters that system, right? Is it going to, is it going to absorb? Is it going to, this is part of the issue with neonicotinoids is that they're quite water soluble. So they're readily detected. If I go down and take a water sample, uh, they don't tend to absorb, but something like glyphosate or like pyrethroids, for example, like they love to absorb. Uh, to sediment. And so the organisms that are going to be exposed is going to be different depending on, you know, wh whether they absorb or, or yeah, but, but yeah. So Julian says in Argentina, some studies have detected glyphosate on water from rain. Uh, do you have any comments or data about this process? What's your stance on that topic? That's interesting because I, I have seen a few studies about that, you know, glyphosate in rain. I, I don't, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't want to comment. I haven't read this study that was done in Argentina, um, but I'm just trying to think about uh, the pathway of, 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 of glyphosate getting into rain, like, cause it's implying that glyphosate is volatile, is, is volatile, you know, and then it's, 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 it's being, you know, trapped in rain droplets and i just the the the, the 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 physical chemical properties of glyphosate right it's 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 henry's law constant is is wouldn't suggest that it would volatilize so that's where i have trouble with that one right like um but again I, i'm not an expert on that but i do i'm a little concerned about the physical chemical con you know it's kind of constraints there because why would glyphosate, you know, be moving into the gas, like it volatilizing and then being trapped? And yeah. Um, yeah. I, I agree with you on that. It's, it's, it's not uh, the, the glyph, if we get the glyphosate uh, physical chemical characteristics, we would we will not expect that at a great portion anyway, because it doesn't go to their atmosphere uh, from the liquid phase to a vapor phase yeah uh, i mean you know Canada, and maybe it may, maybe some drift that and depending on how they collect if it was just after a, some application that some of that had drift so mm -hmm. but yeah we, we would not I, expect that as a common thing that's what I, yeah, I, I, that's what I, I agree with Edge in that, like, I would really look at how it was collected, where, how, not, not to say that I don't want to speak poorly of the authors, because I don't know the study, but um, it just, the, 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 the chemistry, the physics of it, it doesn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't think that's common, you know, it's not like some, of, uh, in Canada, we do have issues with some of our older uh, organochlorine insecticides, right, uh, that are very persistent, that are relatively volatile, and we get this what's called the grasshopper effect. So, you know, we find these organochlorine insecticides in the Arctic where they've never been used, but it's because of that global distillation. Um, but, but, but the characteristics, uh, we know what characteristics a chemical should have in order for the global distillation to be possible. And glyphosate doesn't fit that at all. So, yeah. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a good question. Uh, Juan, I'd like to know if this herbicide stays long enough for affecting midterm to the organisms in and around the aerial applications. Um, yeah, so that's, that's a good question. Um, and, to, and, and this is where I think there's a, a weakness uh, or, or a source of uncertainty in the risk assessment is that we, you know, we didn't even we didn't have the opportunity to get down on the field in the field and measure uh, glyphosate in the stream or in the sediment or in or in the soil uh, where the application was occurring. Um, and again, so we, you know, we can't say with certainty how long it was there. I mean, one of the things we were very conservative in our assessment. We assumed a 15 centimeter deep pond, right? Where you have no renewal. And as you could see from the picture, most of the water bodies in that region, because it's quite mountainous, are streams, right? They're, they're, they're lodic, like they're moving water. So that would dilute 
whatever did make it into the stream very quickly. But we took a more conservative approach and said, okay, worst case scenario, we've got a 15 very shallow pond that's, that's lentic, you know, standing water. Um, so I, I think we, we try to incorporate that into our assessment. Um, but again, that is a source of uncertainty. You know, you, if you have the choice and you have the resources, you won't actually want to get on, you know, the field and, and measure uh, in, in, in uh, whatever ecosystem you're concerned about over time. So So Julian has, is legally allowed aerial application of glyphosate in Canada? Yes. So um, in forestry, this occurs in, in Canada and the U.S., um, glyphosate uh, is used predominantly in the forestry industry. So they use it uh, for, I'll just try to give you a quick idea of why they use it. They use it for site preparation. So for example, if I, if I cut... Um, if I, you know, if I clear cut a section of the forest, um, I may, I may, uh, I may apply glyphosate to knock down any broad leaves before I go in and plant the, the pine, the conifers, like the, the, the species that I want to grow, because I want to reduce competition uh, for those, those new seedlings. And then maybe 10, maybe 15 years down the road, I might do another application. It's called conifer release. And again, it's about, because because the glyphosate formulation, it has to do with uptake. Uh, it doesn't have an effect on the pine, like the conifer trees. And so what you're doing is you're trying to knock down any grasses or, or broad leaves that are going to compete. Uh, because ultimately you're farming spruce trees or pine, you know what I mean? And so... So they do use it, and because pine and spruce are not as sensitive, because they don't uh, take up uh, uh, take up glyphosate like like a broadleaf would weeds, it's used, and so yeah, it's readily used. It's a quite it's a contentious issue. Like I've spoken about it a lot. I mean, it's particularly since the 2015 IARC decision about carcinogenicity, people are worried uh, about its use in forestry. But yeah, it's, 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 it's aerial application, not so much in agriculture uh, in Canada, but definitely in forestry. So uh, yeah, so Juan said, uh, please, I'm looking forward on my request about data of toxicity. Okay, yes. Um, cool. Yeah, Juan. Um, I, I actually, got the email and I, I'll send to oh, you. Okay, yeah. And then if, if anybody wanted my email address, I, I'm sorry, I should have put it on the slides, but please just uh, talk to Edge. Uh, he will, he can get you my email. Mm -hmm. um, Casio, no problem. Thank you. Um, uh, Irma asks, is the risk in humans increased or would it increase with this new formulation? Um, you know, I, I think the risk to humans um, has the, the change in the formulation. I don't think really like the, the, the switching out of the, of the surfactant, I really don't think changed the risk to humans. Um, we know that the surfactant actually breaks down pretty quickly. It's both of them, POEA and the, uh, polyalkyl glycosides are very susceptible to microbial degradation and absorption. Um, the, if the risk to humans from it would, would likely come from glyphosate. Um, but again, risk is a, is a, is a factor of not only toxicity, but also exposure and probability of exposure. So, um, and they did do a human, they did look at, uh, the human, there wasn't a human health assessment and, uh, and they found that the risk of this program to humans is relatively low just because the exposure to humans was relatively low. Right. Uh, so they did do some, you know, they would, me they measured glyphosate uh, in water, you know, drinking water in the area. They, they looked at actual edible crops, whether there was any contamination. They also looked at microsomes within the blood of, of people, who lived in that area, right, which can be a measure of DNA damage and stuff like that, but they didn't find anything that would indicate there would be uh, 
you know, considerable exposure or a level of exposure that would be a concern. Um, so I don't, I don't think the change in formulation had any influence on, on human health. Um, yeah. So, but that, that's a whole other seminar or series of seminar. There could be a whole seminar series on, on uh, human health glyphosate right now. Cause it's uh, very contentious. I mean, in Canada, health Canada has, it continues to allow it to be used. Um, they feel that the level of exposure is, ex you know, is low enough. Um, and then the United States as well, like has continued. I mean, the United States has some really long-term epidemiological studies done with farmers, right? Cause farmers are likely the ones who are going to be, uh, you receive the greatest exposure. So they have some really long, like 15, no, I mean, 25 years, they've been tracking, I think a thousand families, you know, farming. And so that, anyway, if you're interested in the epidemiological data, cause that's really like the best type of data when you're looking at incidents or whether uh, something is going to cause a particular disease or increase the rate of a particular disease, like using rat models or mammalian cell lines is, is, a, is an important tool, uh, but that's a lower tier, right? Like there's a lot of uncertainty there and the exposure is, you're not even considering exposure because I'm feeding the rat chemical A. The best type of data, but the data that takes the most time and, 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 and most effort is that epidemiological data where you're actually tracking people and you're quantifying their exposure and then you're looking at uh, the and if there is an increased incidence of particular diseases within that population. Unfortunately, that takes time and resources, but that's the best data, really, if you want to get at uh, does exposure to a particular contaminant cause, you know, increased risk to, of cancer or Parkinson's or, you know, uh, and so the United States has been doing some, uh, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control has some really good data there. Their data would indicate that there isn't an increase or significant increase in incidence of any cancers in these groups. Um, so, you know, yeah, you know, but I, but I, but at the same time, I mean, if, if you have the choice of limiting your exposure, then definitely do that, right? Like, why wouldn't you? But, uh, you know, outright banning is not sometimes the best solution. I mean, we're, we're dealing with that now, for example, in Canada with neonicotinoid insecticides, they're, the government would really like to phase out thymethoxin, imidacloprid, clothianidin. But the problem is, okay, great, you ban it, cool. But there's just another, you know, like the, 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 the farmers are not all going to go organic. I mean, you know what I mean? Like they're just, we're just going to, they're, they're already starting to look at replacements like flu powder to furone and the diamides, clothianidin. And, and so, you know, I, I think it's better to try to mitigate risk. You know, banning is not, I think sometimes the public feels like that's the best solution, but I think we need to get better at mitigating risk, right? Figuring out, well, how do we reduce exposure to these important ecosystems? Banning is not really, that's a short term, like, you know, now not to say there are instances like organochlorines. Yeah, those we definitely should have, that we did, that's the right decision to ban those. Um, but, we, you know, we need to, yeah, we need to think about that. Uh, otherwise, we're just in this cycle of banning and then we let new products come on and do their thing and then we ban them. It's just, it's not good for the farmers it's not good for the environment you know what i mean like we need to be smarter we are smarter we need to we may need to make smarter decisions uh, so that we can still be productive with the arable acres that we have um while still protecting human health and the environment as best we can right so yeah perfect ryan uh, ryan you we we could see that the topic uh, was very interesting to the audience. We had a lot of questions. Uh, uh, I want to just make a, a, a two questions for you, and uh, yeah. and maybe you could just you. I think you you point that out. But 
uh, if you have to, to think about chemicals that we use in agriculture 30 years ago and now, what do you say? The risk is greater now or lower? Well, uh, much lower. Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> No, yeah, that's so you can answer that. And I, ask yeah, much later. lower. I mean, and the thing is, is that, uh, you know, we got to give ourselves a little bit of credit, like we have learned from the mistakes that we've made. Um, and in that, you know, when you look at the rigor, the regulatory rigor uh, that's been put in place um, for, uh, I mean, pesticides are, I mean, and I know this isn't true for every jurisdiction, right, but it, it's, it's growing. Right. But I mean, pesticides are one of the most heavily regulated chemicals, right? They're right up there with pharmaceuticals. I mean, that's, you know, and so, you know, we've learned that you, you need to regulate it. You need the, you know, it needs to be, uh, uh, there needs to be a data rich process for making decisions. And, and uh, so, I mean, I, I think definitely the risk to human health, the risk to ecological health, um, from pesticides is is much lower than it was before um just because of you know again the process the rigor that that they go through um um you know i mean yeah i mean not and we should still continue to do that right to be smart uh to get data before we decide whether we're going to register something or what it's going to be registered for which crops it's going to be used on right we need to be um but, you know, it, it, and so it's a complex issue because, you know, uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of my naive young students think, well, why don't we just all, you know, why they're obviously not from a farming background, but they they're like, well, why don't we all just do organic? But they don't realize like, OK, you know, let's think about this. You know, if we were, we were to stop using pest management or chemicals and pest management and, you know, we, we could still continue to produce some food. But we wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be as productive, which means in order to produce the same amount of food, we're going to require, you know, more acres. And I think that's that's a greater risk to ecological health, right? Is is converting more of our natural ecosystems into ag, you know what I mean, into agricultural. That that poses a much greater risk to biodiversity. I think, you know, I, the key is to be as productive with the acres, the arable acres we have and protect those arable acres, protect the soil quality um, and, and be as productive as possible so that we don't have to uh, continue to remove, uh, you know, convert. Because uh, habitat destruction, I would imagine, is probably the number one, you know, uh, number one risk to biodiversity and I'm sure most countries, you know, and so that part of, you know, so it, it's a, it's, it's, it's a complex issue and uh, you know, yeah, sorry, I could go on forever. No, that's good. It's a good, it's a good point. Uh, and I, I want to just ask you uh, the, the last question. So we, we can close uh, from the, 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 your, your team, Today, the topics, the chemicals, the contaminants that uh, you are studying now, they are more related to agriculture or human as a, as a human? Like, if you have to think, where, where is the, the primary focus of your research now? It comes mm -hmm. from things that we use in agriculture or things that people are, uh, say, yeah. pharmaceuticals or... Yeah, whatever. yeah. So, I mean, uh, I, I, my work, because uh, like in my region, agriculture is a huge part of regionally. So I still do a lot of work on, um, you know, monitoring pesticides um, and looking at the fate of them. Uh, so pesticides still play an important role, like in my research program. But I mean, I'm starting to find, you know, that there are other contaminants that are much greater risk to our, our aquatic ecosystems and that sort of thing. So for example, in Canada, where I live in the winter, we spread salt on the roads, right. To keep, and this is true for the Northern United States as well. We spread salt on the roads to uh, keep the roads clear, right. To keep the pavement, you know, from ice from forming. And we're, I'm finding that that is a much bigger issue to our aquatic ecosystems in this part of, in this province than pesticides ever will be, right? Chloride, right? Because it's sodium chloride. 
you know, we're, we're basically, you know, it's, it's like the salinization of our freshwater streams at certain times of year. That has a much greater impact on the health of fish and invertebrates and primary producers than, than, than pesticides. So, you know, while I continue to do work because there's always new actives and, you know, more data, you know, but relatively, you know, um, things like uh, nutrients, you know, um, chloride, um, those temperature, right? Warming streams, those probably pose a much greater risk to the, to the freshwater ecosystems that we have. Uh, pesticides really probably represent very, very small component of that. And partly because of Ontario has, you know, put into place like buffer, you know, we, we buffer streams and rivers and, 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 and restrict application of nutrients and pesticides, you know, in agriculture areas near freshwater ecosystems. But um, so that's a great example of mitigation, right? Like you can, we still, you know, we need the agriculture. It's an important part of the industry or economy in our, in Southern Ontario. Uh, but there's things that we can do to limit the impact on, on natural systems. But anyway, but we still have the salt issue. And this, that's another really interesting issue because it does have an impact on aquatic systems, but there's a human health perspective, right? Because car accidents, um, right? Like there's a, there's, you want to keep people safe who are driving. And then there's another element of the insurance, right? The car insurance industry, right? They don't want, <laughs> like they want salt to be used because they want those roads to be safe, right? Because it all factors in. So it's anyway, it's, it's an interesting, uh, you know, a complex, more complex issue sometimes than, than you realize, but yeah. Well, we take risks every minute of our life. Life is, is taking risk is part of the life. So exactly. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much, Ryan, for your excellent presentation, act, uh, excellent discussion that we that we had. We're gonna close uh, today's webinar. Uh, just wanna make a note, uh, telling people that uh, we may have an, another one. We are still working on it. We had scheduled this to be the last one, but we may have one next week. So uh, we're going to keep you all posted uh, by email and uh, by your media. So uh, yeah. we, you can uh, get update on that. Yeah. And if anybody, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to chat. Uh, you need one information you're interested, uh, you know, just reach out to Edge. Uh, he'll he'll give you my email. I'm always happy to to connect with people and chat and stuff like that. So don't hesitate, please. Thank you so much. Appreciate it, uh, everyone. Stay safe and uh, we 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 keep you posted if we have another one next week. Uh, once again, thank you to our Brazilian with Science Society for providing the Zoom so we can uh, perform this activity, Professor. Ryan, thank you so much. Thank you, Edge. Good evening. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye -bye.